Researchers spent most of the 20th century seeking to understand how bodies fatigue. What gradually emerged was an idea of the human body as a machine, the rationale being that if you understand how a machine works, you can calculate its ultimate limits. This came to a head in 1991 when Michael Joyner, an ex-collegiate runner who was completing a medical residency at the Mayo Clinic, proposed a thought experiment. At that time, the limits of endurance running, according to physiologists, could be quantified with three parameters, aerobic capacity, known as VO2 max, running economy, which is an efficiency measure, and lactate threshold. Researchers had measured these variables in lots of elite runners, and those runners tended to have very good values in all three parameters, and exceptional values in one or two. Joyner wondered what would happen if a single runner happened to have exceptional but humanly possible values in all three parameters. His calculations predicted that this runner would be able to complete a marathon in 1 hour, 57 minutes and 58 seconds. Now we'll come back to that value, but let's unpack that idea of the body as a combustion engine. Your VO2 max reflects your aerobic limits, the maximum rate at which your heart, lungs and muscles can effectively use oxygen during exercise. Many wearable sensors like GPS running watches use different prediction algorithms to estimate your VO2 max, but the gold standard approach involves going to a physiology lab. There, you would be fitted with a mask connected to a machine that measures oxygen consumption while you run on a treadmill. As the speed on the treadmill is increased, your oxygen demands go up. At some point, your oxygen consumption plateaus despite the increasing treadmill speeds. At this limit, your VO2 max, your legs demand energy at a rate that aerobic processes can't match, so you have to draw on fast-burning anaerobic, without oxygen, energy sources, like glycolysis. The end of the test is nigh, because speeds above this range cannot be sustained as muscles become more and more acidic due to the buildup of lactate. Your muscles' ability to tolerate high levels of lactate what we would now call anaerobic capacity is the other key determinant of endurance events lasting less than about 10 minutes. Your lactate threshold then is the intensity of exercise that causes lactate to accumulate in the blood at a faster rate than it can be removed. It essentially defines the border between an activity being aerobic or anaerobic. It too is an important threshold and varies from person to person. Practically speaking, your VO2 max doesn't have much of an effect on the speed you can attain during short, maximum intensity bursts, but the longer the distance, the more it matters. For a 100 meter sprint, only 10% of your energy comes from aerobic respiration, but that percentage increases to 30% over 400 meters, 60% for 800 meters, and 80% for a mile. The farther you go, the more your maximum speed benefits from a high VO2 max. And this plays out in elite athletes. Your typical moderately fit male weighing about 80 kilos would have a VO2 max of between 50 to 60 milliliters per kilo per minute. This is the unit for VO2 max. It's a volume in milliliters expressed relative to body weight over time. A well-trained recreational athlete might hit the mid 60s with the elites in the 70s and 80s and beyond. Now there used to be a perception which stems from the man as machine idea that I was talking about at the start, that VO2 max was the key physiological variable in running performance. The problem with this idea is that for distances beyond about five kilometers, runners don't actually use this maximum amount. They run at a sub-maximal level. And this has been demonstrated in studies where increasing levels of VO2 max are not uniformly associated with improvements in performance. One factor that I've already mentioned is lactate threshold. Physiologists have known since the 1970s that lactate threshold, the fastest speed you can maintain without triggering a dramatic rise in blood lactate levels, is a very accurate predictor of marathon time. That's why Michael Joyner incorporated it into his equation for the sub two hour marathon I'd mentioned before, along with a third variable known as running economy. 
Running economy is a measure of how much oxygen a runner uses for a given submaximal speed. In theory, two runners can have the same VO2 max, and then the one who is more economical at submaximal speeds is likely to be faster over longer distances. Running economy is defined as the total volume of oxygen needed to run one kilometer. This total volume doesn't vary greatly for the same runner at different running speeds, particularly if they are well trained. In other words, if you are an elite or relatively experienced recreational runner, regardless of how fast you run, you use more or less the same volume of oxygen to run the same distance. There are always exceptions. Some runners will become more or less efficient as they run faster, but in general, the value stays the same. Now this might be a little confusing because I said earlier that the faster you run, the more oxygen you use. And this is true relative to time, but not distance. Taking an athlete running at a pace of four minutes per kilometer, let's say he is using about 200 milliliters per kilo of oxygen to run that kilometer. If we look at his oxygen use per minute, we can calculate that he is using 50 milliliters of oxygen per kilo per minute because it takes him four minutes to run that kilometer and use those 200 milliliters per kilo of oxygen. Let's say our runner increases his speed to three minutes per kilometer. We can assume that he still needs 200 milliliters per kilo of oxygen to run that kilometer. If we look at his oxygen use per minute, we can calculate that he is using 67 milliliters of oxygen per kilo per minute. But this is the key bit. The use of oxygen per minute goes up with running speed, but the use per kilometer remains relatively constant. He is still using 200 milliliters of oxygen, just over less time. That's how running economy works. People with better running economy tend to have a lower vertical oscillation of the center of mass. They also tend to move their arms less and have more flexed knees during the swing phase of gait. Their stride lengths tend to be optimized to the dimensions of their own body, so not too long, not too short. When it comes to height, men who are slightly shorter than average tend to have better running economies, although the reverse is true in women, and the reason for this apparent contradiction is unclear. In terms of overall physique, those with an ectomorphic type of physique and those with a lower body fat percentage tend to have the best running economy because more body fat means more body mass, increasing the oxygen cost of running. People with better running economy usually have a narrower pelvis, smaller than average feet, and have a leg morphology where most of the weight is distributed closer to the hips, so smaller calves relative to their quads. When it comes to the muscle within those legs, while all muscle cells work similarly, the fibers of skeletal muscle cells that move our bones come in two main varieties. At one extreme are slow twitch fibers that do not contract rapidly or powerfully, but use energy aerobically. They don't fatigue easily. These type one fibers contrast with the other type, the fast twitch type two fibers, which themselves come in two variations in humans. Type 2X fibers burn sugar to generate powerful and rapid forces but fatigue rapidly, while the type 2A fibers produce moderately powerful forces aerobically and thus fatigue at an intermediate rate. Although type 2A fibers are best for medium intensity activities like racing a mile, the type 2X fibers are best suited to bursts of extreme power of short duration like sprinting 100 meters. And because the type 1 fibers are associated with the lower energetic costs of running, in other words, a better running economy, they are suited to longer distances like the marathon. And that brings us back to Michael Joyner's 1991 prediction time of just under 1 hour and 58 minutes. The prediction only involved three inputs, VO2 max, lactate threshold and running economy. But here's the problem with the man as machine idea. In it, every machine has a maximum capacity. And if elite athletes are indeed at the limits of that capacity, why then are there so few deaths in endurance sport? And why do we so often see a finishing spurt where athletes who apparently are so close to the complete fatigue are able to summon one last effort as they cross the line? This is where the idea of a central governor comes into play. We'll talk about that next.